Hi, I'm John, the MedPot Combat Engineer Termel, and this is the case of the almost 400 applicants for MedPot Grow Permits who are seeking damages for having their processing of their permits take so long. Now, under the old regime, it took a month to process a grow permit. Suddenly, under Trudeau's regime, it's now taken six months, eight months, 11 months, when it used to take one. So I developed a template which allowed people to sue in federal court for the damages for the pot they could have grown past one month and for the rent and expenses they lost while they were waiting. So Judge Brown, well, the Crown tried to strike the action as no cause of action, frivolous, you know, there's no reason they should be angry just because they paid an extra six months rent without being able to use their site and they're missing six, half a year's worth of pot and under stress while they're waiting. So you had the, all these people who filed applications to get damages for having been stalled so long by the bureaucracy. Now there were other actions, there were motions, people whose exemptions were expiring, they would now have to destroy everything. So I had motions that allowed them to get in front of the judge on short notice to say, ah, I need an interim exemption or I'm going to have to do all this stuff and destroy my stuff and lose my pot. And the crowd always came up with a hop to an exemption on time to tell the judge, no need to have a hearing, it's mooted now. We got it to him. Now we're talking like 80 different people who did this kind of stuff. So who made these motions to the judge. So the judge is very aware of the incompetence and the devastating effects of Health Canada's delays in processing permits. Now, Judge Brown also caught them on backdating the permits. If it took six months to process, they didn't start your year, year permit right then. They backdated it to when the doctor signed, so you lost six months, and you only got six months left before you got to go pay a doctor for another medical document. So, he made them stop that by just demanding, why are you doing that? And he said, okay, we're stopping it. <laughs> and finally, the last thing we won was in the old days, the, if an LP said we're not going to provide for you anymore, you had to go back to your doctor to get a new medical document. They were not allowed to send it back to you. Can you imagine who could have thought that up? Well, anyway, they stopped doing that. So there are some good that's come out of these actions, but here we are now with 400 people demanding action for the damages during the delay. Now, the judge picked one lead plaintiff, Jeff Harris, who presented all the arguments and filed all the documentation. And then the judge and the Crown made a motion to strike all the actions as frivolous. And the judge said, no, 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 I'm going to let him in. I think there might be an argument here for damages for bureaucratic delay, letting it in. So the Crown appealed and three judges overturned it. And they slapped Harris around like, what do you know? And da, da. So he, you know, they embarrassed them, they, he thinks. But still, they were nasty to him and, uh, and came up with some stupid reasons. Now, here's the interesting thing. Majiko was the first person to bring up the backdating issue and the restitution of the time. He wants the restitution added to his next permit. So the Crown made a motion to dismiss his action in particular. So, when Harris's appeal got dismissed, the Crown said, look, he lost, I want you to strike Majeko too. And the judge said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to issue the same decision as, as I did against Harris, letting him win, and you guys can appeal. And they appealed. And now here's the Majeko appeal. So, he's appealing the Harris judges who came up with a lot of mistakes. And we're saying, before we get to the Supreme Court, we want this second guy to bring up all the mistakes that happened to Harris. All right, so here's Majiko's decision now. The issues are, I'm going to run over them quick, okay? The Crown said that basically there's no right to grow, and the judges said that too. There's, no one's ever proved there's a right to grow, and yet we pointed out that Section 313.1 says if the requirements set out in Section 312 are met, the minister must register the applicant and issue them a registration certificate. Well, what does must mean to most humans? Not judges, but to most humans, must means you gotta. And that means that you got a right to what they gotta do. And these judges said you don't have a legal right to what they have to do. Isn't that neat? 
And that's why we appealed, brought it to the court's attention. That's one error. Insufficient facts to establish a violation of rights. Well, Judge Brown listed 18 different facts he could figure out just by knowing the start date when they applied and then when they got their decision and how much time was wasted in between. And he could figure out everything else in between and laid out 18 facts. And they keep saying there's not enough facts. So they say there's nothing to indicate that Mr. Harris would not have been able otherwise to obtain marijuana from an LP, a licensed producer. So if he could have been able to obtain it from a licensed producer because he could afford it, well, then it's okay if we stall you for six extra months and let you waste money on losing your gross site rent, right? So that's one of their arguments. We shot that down. And they say when a person grows his or own marijuana, there will necessarily be a delay for the time that it takes the marijuana plant to mature and produce a usable product. We're not talking about the plant cycle. We're talking about the delay cycle. Jeez, these are judges. So anyway, and finally, there's a constant. Now, we're asking for full restitution of the time they ripped us off. Because when they said we're stopping to do it, We'd said, hey, we want you to give us back what you took. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. Anybody, we're stopping the ripoff on March the 2nd, but we're not going to fix how we ripped people off in the past. So we appealed when the judge said it was too small, you know, to, as a constitutional violation for the time back. But we simply appealed on the grounds that they didn't solve our problem with their March the 2nd uh, ministerial uh, Section 56 order. And the damages are not too trivial when you're paying a thousand bucks to get a license. And the remedy is too trivial not to have been granted. All he had to say was add the period taken on the end of their next permit, right? That's all it would have taken to fix the ripoff for everybody. But anyway, so that's, and the last issue is while Harris was at the Court of Appeal, the first judge said, Hey, where's a notice of constitutional question? And the Crown went, What? What? We didn't file one. We didn't think we needed one. And the lady judge says, Look, if you want to argue that a constitutional motion is frivolous, you got to raise some constitutional arguments. Oh, oh, we don't think we had to. Well, they said, We'll think about it and tell you later. And I never saw them coming up with a decision on whether or not you needed to notice a constitutional question like the lady judge said and the male judge. So, but they slapped Harris down and now Majiko was appealing that decision saying, hey, she said they needed to do a notice of constitutional question, so did he. So we have the same situation. They didn't give me a notice of constitutional question either. So I'm bringing that up. So now we're gonna read the court's decision. And it looks pretty short and terse. Bye. So this is on uh, February the 10th, case 339-18 against Igor Majiko, A, and uh, with judges Webb, Woods, McTavish. Reasons for judgment. Webb wrote it. The appeal and the cross appeal in this matter, appeal is about the um, uh, damages claim being thrown out, and the cross appeal is wanting the time back. Uh, as a result of the order of federal court docket T-92, which dismissed, in part, the motion of the Crown to strike Mr. Majeko's claim. Right? Remember, the judge said, hey, I let Harris in, I gotta let Majeko in. You appealed Harris, go appeal Majeko. So in granting the order, federal court judge noted that Mr. Majeko's statement of claim advanced the same allegations that were raised by Harris. Except the new one, the backdating one in his amended statement of claim, that was also the subject of a motion to strike. Now, Harris was allowed to amend his statement of claim to include the backdating that Majiko had introduced. So, by the order dated July 20th, 2018, the federal court judge dismissed the motion to strike Mr. Harris's amended statement of claim in part. Adopting the reasons that he had given in the Harris action, the federal court judge also dismissed the Crown's motion to strike Mr. Majiko's statement of claim in part. Three. Mr. Harris appealed to this court, seeking to reinstate the parts of his amended statement of claim that were struck, and the Crown Cross appealed, seeking to strike the parts of Mr. Harris's statement of claim that were not struck. By the judgment dated September 18, 2019, this court allowed the Crown's Cross appeal and dismissed Mr. Harris's appeal. So the Crown wins everything. The result was that Mr. Harris's amended statement of claim was struck without leave to amend. Well, luckily, we're going to 
amend it for all the newbies. That's how that works. Over the series of these cases, every time the Crown said something's missing, well, I came up with a new template, number two, stuck it in. Third template, stuck in backdating. Fourth template, stuck in about fundamental justice. Fifth template, we're up to template number eight. Every time they bitched about something missing, we added it for the newbies. And then the old guys can say, we want to adopt the argument of the newbies. That's how this works. So, um, in his appeal, Mr. Majaiko did not seek to distinguish his statement of claim from that of Mr. Harris, but rather submitted that this court erred in striking Mr. Harris's amended statement of claim. Correct. The Crown submitted that reasons adopted by the court in Harris, uh, Mr. Majaiko's statement of claim should also be struck. At the hearing of this appeal, Majaiko only raised one issue, whether the failure of the Crown to serve notice of constitutional question was fatal to the Crown's argument that his statement of claim should be struck. The argument is reflected in paragraphs 48 and 49 of his memorandum. He didn't say um, he only raised one issue. He said, I stand on all the issues in my memorandum, in particular the lack of notice of constitutional question. But are they going to say now that he didn't raise those issues in his memorandum because he focused on paragraphs 48 and 49? Which are, in the recent appeal of Harris of a motion to strike the Section 52 claim of constitutional violation, both Justices Peltier and Gauthier noted that there had been no, constitution, no notice of constitutional question for the motion to strike a constitutional claim. Justice Gauthier said the constitutionality must be argued to some extent if the Crown says the claim of unconstitutionality is frivolous. And this is still us writing. The Crown arguing that the facts do not show a constitutional violation is as constitutional an argument as me arguing that the facts do show a constitutional violation. In moving to strike a Section 52 claim of constitutional violation, respondent submits that a notice of constitutional question should have been given herein as well. The appellant failed to file a notice of constitutional question below, and therefore Judge Brown's dismissal of the motion was therefore justified for other reasons and should not be overturned. No citation is provided for the is provided for the decision in which Mr. Majaiko is referring in paragraph 48. Now, what decision is that? In Harris, hmm, no citation is provided for a decision out of their court. Hmm, uh, but I would note that the citation for the decision of this court in Appeal A-175-19, the reasons were written by Justice Woods with Justice Peltier and Gauthier concurring. However, the statement quoted by Mr. Majaiko above does not appear anywhere in these reasons. That's right. And this is written by who? Webb, okay, not Woods. So, yeah, they didn't answer. They said they would tell him whether he needed one or not, and they didn't answer. They left it empty. So, and they put, well, if they didn't answer, it must mean they didn't need one, right? Isn't that what they're going to say? So no citation was there. The reasons were written by Justice Woods, and however, the statement does not appear anywhere in those reasons. Well, it's in the transcript okay, of the hearing. If you take the transcript of the hearing, you'll hear the judges say it to Harris. Oh, but it's not in their decision. Who cares? They said it. Subsections 57, 1 and 2 of the Federal Court Act state, if the constitutional validity, applicability, or operability of an act of parliament or of the legislature of a province or of regulations made under such an act is in question before the Federal Court of Appeal or the Federal Court or Federal Board Commission or other tribunal, other than a service tribunal within the meaning of the National Defense Act, the act or regulation shall not be judged to be invalid, inapplicable, or inoperable unless notice has been served on the Attorney General of Canada and the Attorney General of each province in accordance with subsection 2. The notice must be served at least 10 days before the date of the hearing, unless the Court of Appeal extends the time. Subsection 57.1 provides that where the constitutionality of an act or regulation is in question, like we brought it into question, the act or regulation shall not be judged invalid, inapplicable, or inoperable, unless notice has been served. Oh, so it can be judged operable without notice being served, is what they're going to say. In this case, no act or regulation has been judged invalid, inapplicable, or inoperable. 
Therefore, no notice of any constitutional question was required. Whoa! So it's only required if you're going to shoot down the law. But if it's to stop someone from shooting down the law, you don't need to send a notice of constitutional question. Hmm. Looks pretty strong. I think I'm going to drop that at the Supreme Court. So, so uh, in any event, neither subsection 57 or if 1 or 2 um, specify who must serve the notice of constitutional question. <laughs> Maybe we should have. It would be logical that in any matter where a person is asking to have a particular act or regular regulation judged to be invalid, inapplicable, inoperable, the person who's requesting the result will want to ensure that the appropriate notice is served. Ah, good point, good point. As noted above, Mr. Majeko did not seek to distinguish his statement of claim from the statement of file by Mr. Harris. I would therefore allow the Crown's appeal. I would also dismiss Mr. Majiko's cross appeal. I would set aside the order issued by the federal court in this matter, rendering the decision that the federal court should be made. I would allow the Crown's motion to strike Majiko's statement of claim, and I would strike his statement of claim without leave to amend, and I would award the Crown costs in the amount of $3,500. And it asked for about $5,800, so I cut it in half. Oh, no, more. So, that's the situation. Now you'll notice they didn't deal with the fact that they'd said that there was no right to grow. And we pointed out the minister must. And they'd said there were insufficient facts. And we pointed out the 18 facts that Judge Brown had cited in our memorandum. Notice they ducked it. And we pointed, so what else did we point out? Basically, they ducked everything. They simply dealt with the notice of constitutional question issue, saying that that's paragraphs 48 and 49, and they ignored everything else. That's what happened. So, now we're going to be doing an appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, saying the only missing thing that they said, well, first of all, all those mistakes that the Crown, that the court didn't even deal with, where we got no right to grow when the minister must give us a permit? You know, you didn't bother going to check that out. We raised it. So, they ignored every issue we raised, except the one where we made where they had an argument. Got that? Isn't that not honorable? Anyway, so now here's back what's going on. We've had a new lady who has been stalled for four months and she filed a statement of claim to get an exemption and an interim, interim exemption. And then Health Canada delivered it six days later. Now they're saying, hey, we want to throw out her statement of claim because Harris got his thrown out. Now, she's saying, hey, I filed, and they're saying, by the way, some of the other guys who had a number eight statement of claim with the hole filled also had theirs dismissed when you only kept one guy, Vetracek, alive to fight. Well, she can say, well, fine, we should have kept one guy with a number eight still on tap, but I'm going to be that person. I'm coming in. I'm filing an opposition. And I want to know whether this new statement of claim has fixed it. And that's where we're at. So the Crown is trying to say that because those other ones were thrown out without them arguing, as if they should have been, they didn't. They didn't want to face the $150 costs. Only one guy would do that. And he's a guy that had been stalled nine months before they opened the envelope. So talk about owing him money. And uh, so that's where we are now. So those answers are coming up. We've got 60 days to file to the Supreme Court of Canada. That's probably by March the 8th or 9th. Oh, February, sorry, add two. March the 10th or 11th. Uh, wait a minute, March, April. Anyway, after April Fool, we have to file in the Supreme Court of Canada and point out that these judges, by saying, oh, he only talked about this. Well, guess what? At the hearing, he said, listen, I, I stand on what's in my memorandum written by John Turmel sitting beside me here. You want to let him speak and explain it to you? And they said, no, no, you. He said, well, the only thing I want to mention for sure is the technicality, okay? But I stand on my memorandum. And now they said that because he only talked about the technicality that they can beat at his hearing, that all the rest of the stuff, all the other arguments in his memorandum don't count. He didn't bring them up, so they don't count. That's what this court did, Federal Court of Appeal. Justices Webb, Woods, and McTavish. So, that's what they did to 400 people 
who had their permits delayed six months, eight months, ten months, who had their per they had their permits renewals threatened with expiry and all these sufferings that went on. And uh, the judge is saying, no, 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 those sufferings don't matter. You know, they didn't violate your rights. Dismissed. Not enough facts. Imagine that. So anyway, that's the problem. Judge Brown saw the victims, heard the victims, read the victims' testimonials and motions, and these judges didn't. They only read what the Crown told them, all right, about the one issue. So the Crown, uh, the judges simply focused on the one thing that he talked about and then said because he didn't talk about it and because he only said I stand on what's in my memorandum, that doesn't count. We're not going to look at it and we're not going to deal with it. And they didn't. Federal Court of Appeal. So, that's what's going on right now, keeping the action going. 